Ethelflaed of the Mercians. Um, this is another one of our uh, segments on prominent women of the Middle Ages, um, the European Middle Ages. Um, now, if you've never heard of Ethelflaed and you've never had heard of the Mercia, um, I kind of suspect you're in the 99.999% of people on this planet who've never heard of Ethelflaed or of, the, of Mercia. Um, this period of time really could be called the Dark Ages. Uh, the invasions by Vikings and Magyars and Saracens left uh, Europe reeling and frankly, um, pretty much burnt down. Um, Europe was severely uh, damaged during this time period. And, uh, and that's only going to, when only when it emerges from this time period, are we going to see something that we can actually call Europe. Um, but um, Ethelflaed is the daughter of one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of English or Anglo-Saxon kings. Uh, she is the daughter of Alfred the Great. Now, Alfred the Great's the only king or queen in the history of England or in the history of the Anglo-Saxons um, who is called the Great. And there's a really good reason for this. He um, the Vikings basically conquer all of what we call England, all of what we call Scotland, most of what we call Wales, most of what we call Ireland in this time period. Alfred held on to a small little piece of land down near the southern coast, down on the southern coast of England. And you know, there's no reason to think that his little strip of land would not be taken from him by the Vikings, but instead he managed to rally the Anglo-Saxons, push the Vikings back with fewer men and fewer supplies than the Vikings had and fewer weapons. Um, and he managed to do that um, in a time period when you would never have thought that could be done. Um, and Alfred was not only a great leader and a great warrior, he was also an intellect, a writer, uh, someone who gave a lot of thought to education uh, and who really wanted to have his people um, be educated and, um, you know, healthy, wealthy, and wise in a manner of speaking. Uh, he was, I, it's hard to find many flaws in Alfred. He was the epitome of what a medieval king should be. Uh, and um, I think the great fits him. Uh, the Vikings were no joke. There was a uh, Viking leader who was criticized because killing children kind of bothered him. Uh, Vikings, um, uh, one of the favorite games of Vikings was they would get on one side of a village with um, swords or pikes or spears and they would ride through the village and see, and see how many children they could put on the end of their pike or their spear. Um, and um, you know, it was kind of a contest uh, to see how many children you could kill. So, the, so these guys are really, really, really uh, terrorists. They, they, they were absolutely committed to terrorizing a region and then the region would stop fighting, um, you know, rather than continue to uh, face the cruelties that the Vikings visited upon different regions. Mercia is right on the front line. Uh, you see right at the bottom here, the little purple region, that's Wessex. That's the region that was saved by Alfred the Great. And um, the kingdom of Mercia is above that. Certainly, uh, the Vikings go through the kingdom. Uh, they're maybe lucky in the sense that they don't stay. Uh, and um, the Mercians are lucky in the sense that in, in Mercia, there was a history of women maybe not rulers, but relatively high up in the power structure, um, which is unlike the rest of the Anglo-Saxon world at this time. Uh, but anyway, I think the key thing here is that Mercia is on the front line. By the way, the five boroughs all belong to Vikings at this point. And you can see that East Anglia belongs to the Vikings. Uh, so, you know, a pretty tough time to be in Mercia. Ethelflaed was married to a man by the name of Ethelred, Ethelred I, um, 
And uh, they came up with a comprehensive, the two leaders came up with a comprehensive strategy, which uh, if featured fortified birds. These are towns. Uh, and this is a good picture of one taken from above, of course. And you can see the defense of this town here. Uh, you can, the walls, 1100 years later, the walls are still very, you know, very noticeable. Uh, they're rather impressive there. Uh, the town is, has water on three sides of it and is on top of a hill. Uh, this, is a, this is a very defensible position. And Ethel Flade and Ethel Red searched for places like this, and they began to build up an interior network of defensive positions with connections. Um, they, um, they worked hard on making certain that these road building in those days was almost non-existent, but they worked hard on making certain that the different fortified towns could be you know, connected to one another. Uh, and the next time the Vikings invade, they're going to find it a little more difficult to invade Mercia. Um, the, um, all of this work, the building up of towns and building walls and you know, trying to make connections to get the um, kingdom unified. Uh, nobody thought of the term capital, but what happens is, is a town of Gloucester becomes essentially the capital of Mercia. Now, now they never said that. That's not how they thought about things. But you need, if you're going to have a defense, you're going to need a capital. And in this particular instance, the capital was, uh, was Gloucester. And these, of course, are some of the walls um, of Gloucester, some of the medieval walls. And, uh, you know, they didn't have uh, modern equipment in those days, uh, and they didn't have uh, modern materials in those days, uh, the mortar and all that um, probably wouldn't meet standards today, but uh, that must have been pretty good because here we are all these years later and those walls are still standing. Um, Ethel Flade was married to Ethel Red, but somewhere around 902, somewhere around 902, Ethel Red became ill. Now, we're not 100% certain what the, what the illness was, but he became more and more incapable of leading. And Ethel Flade stepped into the breach. She was already, as I'll talk about later, she was already a very prominent person, very unusually prominent for a woman. Uh, and um, she essentially takes over the building of towns, which, which really go at a considerable pace under her. And, you know, the building of these connections, which I talk about, um, she is a, a noted uh, leader military leader, and she, as far as we can tell, she believed in leading from the front. And you can see here this picture, which is a little bit uh, dramatic, but it, get, it gets the essence of it. Um, uh, in those days, most fighting was done on the ground, but leaders might have horses. Uh, and so this, uh, this gets a sense of what it's like, uh, or what it was like. And uh, of course, Ethel Flayed, um, you know, displayed her courage. Uh, and, uh, you know, people will follow you if you display your courage. Um, Ethelred finally dies in 9-11. And this is where it gets interesting. Because there were no terms for, at least at that moment, there were no terms for queen. Uh, and so they called her, if you look, read the Anglo-Saxon, they call her the Lady of the Mercians. Um, and of course, that's, um, you know, I think this picture of her here, uh, it, it's a, a little bit on the dramatic side, but again, I think this pretty much captures it. There, as far as we can tell, almost everybody thought that uh, Ethel Flade should take over for Ethel Red. Um, she had proven herself repeatedly in combat and other ways to be um, a very substantial human being. and. I think the Mercians were happy to have her. There really are no complaints about uh, a woman going to be taking over what was essentially the throne in those days. Um, and she was well recognized, um, not just by, you know, not just by the Mercians, but by uh, other kings in, um, in England. And of course, the Vikings were a little bit tentative about moving against her after a number of bad instances occurred to them. Uh, but in 917, the Vikings launched a major assault on Mercia, uh, you know, literally coming from all directions. 
I guess our idea was that if they could crack Mercia, then you know Wessex and other parts of England would be wide open to them. But Ethel Flade's connections, uh, her ability to utilize those fortified towns we've talked about, uh, the skill with which they were placed and where they were placed, they managed not only to hold off the Vikings, but began to push them back. Um, and of course, this is not at all, all what, um, you know, what Vikings were used to. And something strange is going to happen here. Ethel Flade was um, so prominent uh, and so strong um, that essentially the Vikings, believing that Ethel Flade had some kind of divinity to her, uh, which by the way, was not an unusual belief in those days, um, the Vikings accepted the idea that a woman could be this powerful. Uh, and a Viking society was extremely aggressive, extremely masculine um, in almost all ways. And so in 918, a number of Viking leaders submit to Ethelflaed. Now, okay, so, so here we are, um, seven years after the death of Ethelred, and, the, and some of the Viking leaders come to, um, to Ethelflaed and submit. Now, in those days, when you submitted to someone, it was a, a little ritual, is you, you know, who, the person who is submitting would take their hands and put them like this. And the person who was taking the submission would then clasp those hands within their hands. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of enjoy the picture of Ethel Flade, you know, putting her hands um, around the Vikings' hands and accepting them uh, as having submitted to her. Well, unfortunately, all good things come to an end, and Ethelflaed died in the summer of 918. And by the way, there were other Viking leaders at that point who were going to submit to her. Um, and uh, of course, she didn't live to, to take those submissions. But her, her skills, her strategy, her thoughtfulness, um, her ability to think ahead and see ahead had created something really different. Uh, and that is a, um, a kingdom which could, on its own strength, withstand uh, the hammering of the Vikings. And um, uh, Mercia was a better place to live. Uh, but that played also was kind of a chip off her father. Um, this is a church charter here from before Ethelred died. And uh, it basically sets up a church and gives it land because you need, in those days you needed land to support yourself if you were a church or a monastery or what have you. Um, but the interesting thing about this is, is women didn't sign these things. These are official documents, but Ethel Flade's signature is on this one, and it's on some other documents, official document, or what we would call official documents too. And so, um, you know, this, as I say, this is before Ethelred died. In fact, this is before Ethelred got sick that this particular charter was issued. So, what, what, you know, what we're really looking at here is somebody who, even before her husband got sick had become a prominent leader uh, in Anglo what was Anglo-Saxon England at that point. Um, and uh, Ethel Flade also had a sense of her own importance. Um, and as you can see here, it says Ethel Flade rejected the mar marital bed after the birth of her daughter. Um, so she you know, stopped having relations with her husband. On what grounds? Well, she believed that it was be unbecoming for the daughter of a king to give way to delight that always of course intercourse, which could then produce such painful results. And we know uh, that the del her delivery of her daughter was very painful. And so basically she said, you know, I'm worth more than childbirth. Uh, I'm a very capable person and I'm not going to do this, um, not having any way of um, protecting its pregnancy in those days. She simply stopped sleeping with her husband. Um, 
And uh, that, that, you know, you know, again, this is kind of a remarkable decision to be made back in the 900s. Uh, and yet Ethelflaed was so respected and so important that this, um, this went down uh, in a way that you might not expect it to go down. Well, she's a very significant person. And, you know, we enjoy doing these videos. Um, and like anybody who does YouTube, uh, you know, would like to keep doing this. Um, we certainly hope that you're subscribed to this channel. And we would hope that you would put a like on this video. Um, it would be a nice thing to do. Uh, and um, I think uh, if, if you do that, you know, we can keep these videos coming because there are are certainly a lot of prominent women in the Middle Ages. And um, I've heard people say that there weren't. Well, no, that's not correct. Um, there really were people. So, you know, we want to keep doing these videos and we hope that you're subscribed and allow us to keep doing them. Anyway, everybody out there, take care. You know, watch out for yourself. And above all, please stay healthy. Okay, goodbye, and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.